And I thought I would start with this poem um, by a 14th century Persian poet Hafez. With that moon language, admit something. Everyone you see, you say to them, love me. Of course you do not say this out loud, otherwise someone would call the cops. <laughs> Still though, think about this, this great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with a full moon in each eye? That is always saying with that sweet moon language, what every other eye in this world is dying to hear. And that is how that is. In the middle of the meadow, there's a hollow in the hill, sloping southward, slightly sheltered by branches of a willow. In winter, you can't see it, it's just a shadow in the snow. In spring, there blooms a garden where purple iris grow and you wonder how they go there what's the story of their sewing the past's a distant mirror there is no way of knowing did a farmer plant them there did a rodent hide her nest? Did a child place a marker where a pet was laid to rest? No foundation tells their story. No path provides a clue. There's no history or legend to reveal their truth to you in the end doesn't matter the result is what you know a garden in the meadow where purple iris grow so make your mark upon the stone write your words upon the wind, build a t paint a picture, build a tower, give comfort to a friend, your hand will touch the future, though your name be lost at last, if you leave behind some beauty, purple eyes in the grass. your mark upon the stone write your words upon the wind build a tower plant a flower play the mandolin reach out to the future whatever seeds you sow will leave behind a garden where purple iris grow
Where purple iris grow Thank you. you know, I am so thrilled to be given this opportunity to perform here that I feel compelled to honor Cheryl by bringing to it the best poetry I can find. Now, sometimes poetry can be quite serious, and at other times it can be quite sad. But today I brought to you a poem that will make you laugh. It's called The Cookie Thief, and it's written by Valerie Cox. A woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airplane shops, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man sitting behind, beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag in between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. So she munched the cookies and watched the clock as the gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I weren't so nice, I would blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. When only one was left, she wondered what he would do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. <laughs> he offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh brother, this guy had some nerve and he's also rude. Why, he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed for the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded her plane and sank into her seat. Then she sought her, she sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. <laughs> if mine are here, she moaned with despair, the others were his, and he tried to share. <laughs> Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief. Thank you very much. Hello, Holston. Hopkinton. Hello. When I could run faster than I do now, I was a teacher of young children, pint sized citizens who came to Morning Circle eager to sing, recite, and claim their carpet square of fame. With the world at their feet, they stood and shared their discoveries as though they had won something. Labor Day is when my daddy doesn't go to work and pushes me out back on the swings drinking his beers. <laughs> the children followed storytelling as a river running around them, even if they didn't understand, even if they had no English. And I realized that they gave it their all. They, they f informed their stories as though they were on the stage uh, of life. And so I donned a chapeau, 
tied a black cape, put on long gloves, and tucked a bright orange shirt into le pantalon. <laughs> Bonjour, my children. I am Monsieur L'Orange. Let me tell you about my daughter, who was once five like vous. She grew très big and went to live in a country what I love. I flew across the ocean. We were far away, far from leafy streets, soft and predictable. A funicular raised us to a slate gray hazy mount. Paris crouched solid and still at the foot of a domed cathedral. A singer crooned on the steps. A boy balanced and twirled in tandem with his soccer ball. The crowd breathed in wonder, suspended by atmosphere. We tramped the cobblestones and avenues of that great metropolis. Subways screeched like ancient creatures of the underworld. Along La Seine, gargoyles gazed with raven claws. While in Japan, earthquakes cracked the world like a walnut and water poured forth to suffocate Sendai with no place to hide. But look, my children, how tall you have grown, like sunflowers in a Paris jardin, dancing with abandon, steady as the wind, safe for another day. Thank you. Poem I wrote um, actually a long time ago. Um, I have a love affair with turtles, um, and this is called Box Turtle. In my father's garden, this box turtle, the size of my open hand, leaned into her digging. First the back right leg, and then the back left leg, reaching gracefully with her long, curved toes, tenderly hollowing a safe place to lay her four perfectly white, beautifully elongated, rubbery eggs. She would not be distracted or altered from her mission. Now was the time to give her young all she would ever give them. Here was the place to bury her finest work, refilling the hollow with gentle dirt and mulch so carefully arranged, no person or raccoon or any unturtle thing would perceive the ground had ever been disturbed. She finished with as much of a sigh as a box turtle can muster and lumbered off into the tall grass, never to return to what she had so carefully placed. In three months, four turtles, each the size of a quarter, will dig their way to the surface and make a dash for the woods. Unless the ground is too cold or the conditions not correct. And then they will winter over, emerging in the spring. Such sound judgment for creatures who had not yet even been born. To sense that it is infinitely wiser to wait patiently under the snow until the time is right. I get impatient. I want to understand. I want to fix the problem. And when the wisdom of the turtle tells me, be determined, be righteous in my goals, heave a big sigh of relief after a job well done, but have the good sense 
to know when it's time to dig in, time to create, time to walk away, time to winter over, time to burst into the world, time to run for the woods, time to be no more or less than exactly who I am. This is just an observation from my travels. It's titled Democracy. The protest and uproar lasted until daybreak. Without any sign of calming or abating, the humidity in the air is filled with tension and vigilance, and the slightest of movements are followed by suspicion and, ex and examination. The frenzy in their eyes and the anger in their voices makes it clear that the mayhem may be unleashed at any moment without cause or reason. Caution to those venturing beyond their gated high walls. Vigilance and trepidation should lead the way. For every step will be accompanied by distrust and unforeseen peril. If not careful, one may be engulfed by the rage and confusion that fuels the desperation and lawlessness. Frustration and disillusions allows for the slightest of discord or agitation to morph into violence and madness. In a country tittering on the edge of anarchy, the slightest of occurrences may ignite the human wick of unfulfilled and shattered lives. The disenfranchised will fuel the impending mayhem, which is certain to follow. The ensuing hysteria and destruction will terrorize and paralyze the masses, and the havoc created will fuel their fears and insecurities, leaving them feeling powerless and shell-shocked. In their disbelief and horror, many of the old-timers will long for the good old days of strict law and order, dictatorship and intolerance, when dissension was banned, disagreements were frowned upon, and opponents were punished and made to disappear. While the style of governance is seen by many as oppressive and autocratic, its, its zero-tolerance approach kept the streets safe, crime low, allowing for a stable and thriving society. This new era of democracy and freedom is often accompanied by dissension and unrest. For democracy without responsibility is simply misguided disagreement. And freedom without respect is simply the violation of other people's right, just as protests left unmanaged can quickly deteriorate into riots and bloodshed. These types of actions only serve to undermine democracy's liberties and freedoms. And the continuous turmoils will only fuel the masses, paranoias, and skepticism, resulting in exodus of the talented, crippling an already fragile ecosystem. Those left behind will retreat to their houses and rooftops in search of peace and tranquility. For serenity and comfort will be difficult to find amid the heat and the mayhem. That is, until a barreling cool breeze promises to engulf all in its path, demanding a pause and allowing for a moment of reflection. The agitated mountain peaks have been heard and felt, yet they are powerless in the face of human destruction and implosion. Thank you. And this poem is called, This Little Piggy Went to Market. This little piggy went to market is the usual thing you say when you begin pulling the toes of a small child. And I have never had a problem with that. I could easily picture the piggy with his basket and his trotters kicking up the dust on an imaginary road. What always stopped me in my tracks was the middle toe. This little piggy ate roast beef. I mean, I enjoy a roast beef sandwich with lettuce and tomato and a dollop of horseradish, but I cannot see a pig ordering that in a delicatessen. I am probably being a little, being too literal minded here. I'm even, even wondering why it's called horseradish. I should just go along with the beautiful nonsense of the nursery, float downstream on its waters. After all, little Jack Horner speaks to me deeply. I don't want to be the one to ruin a child's, a children's party by asking unnecessary questions about puss in boots, or again, the implications of a pig eating beef. By the way, I'm completely down with going wee, wee, wee all the way home, having done it many times and knowing exactly how it feels. <laughs> Soul, my 
sock, it's always wet And not well healed, nails click on the pavement Oh, the cobbler's call But the healing eludes me Keeping time on the sidewalk My world is getting small called asparagus. A few minutes after hanging up, my father calls back to tell me three new asparagus are coming up. I started the patch from seed at my parents' house years ago. Now my father calls me every time a spear pokes through. With each call, I am reminded of my shortcomings and feel inept. I'm not sure why. The soil in that co corner of their yard is rich. The crop had barely started to yield when I moved to a land that forbids overwintering. I tried, but the transplants failed in Florida. When I moved back north, I tried to transplant again this time, the original patch was so dug in, I could not hack off enough root for the plant to take. 
Or maybe it didn't stand a chance with the woodchucks and voles. I still plan to dig up some more asparagus the next time I visit my father. And here the generations are. Water and soil and seed, not much bigger than coriander, but smooth as a bearing. Years and years of waiting, watching, and missing the ones that race to flower and reseed. The key is to catch the plant when it's young, before it really roots in. Now my father gets mature spears. When he finds one just three inches tall, he gambles on the optimal time to pick that day. If he waits too long, he says it goes to seed. What to do with this girl? I learned to go grow raspberries, but not to build fences. I once battled a groundhog with a shovel in a world full of groundhogs. I dreamt my mother helped me dig up some of the plants, and instead of asparagus, she rose from the ground, full, fleshy, green. Thank you. Peach and pear